Simone, welcome to London, and um, we're going to talk a lot about your, your latest part recording, but I wanted to talk to you about your early days. Um, you didn't have sort of immediate takeoff as a, as a pianist. You, you left college, and, and then what happened? When I graduated Juilliard, I had to sort of figure out how to, um, how to make a living being a pianist, and so I started doing all of the things that pianists do, which is um, I started doing competitions, and um, I did a lot of freelance work. I would play um, a lot of chamber music, a lot of collaborative playing. I had private students, and um, at a certain point I had a, a, a breakthrough in that I auditioned for an organization called Astral Artists, which is located in Philadelphia, and they said they were going to present me in a debut recital, and I should think about my program. And um, so I was thinking about it and what I was going to play. And then I found out that um, I was pregnant. And my husband and I had not expected that at all. And, um, and it felt like, oh gosh, you know, these two things have happened at the same time. I'm going to have the debut recital and I'm going to have a baby. And something about it made me decide that I wanted to learn the Goldberg variations. I felt like it was a momentous occasion in my life and I wanted to learn my favorite piece and a really large, a really substantial work. And then um, I had the debut recital after having my son and started to perform the Goldberg Variations a lot. And this was about the age of 29, 30. And, um, and my whole career took a different route from, from that moment. It's a, r a remarkable story about you es essentially just deciding this was a piece you wanted to record. With, and, and so you went ahead and recorded it. The record business being what it is, I didn't think that I had any chance of having a label do it. Um, and I didn't have any management at that time either. So it was, I was in a kind of position of n zero power. Um, but I thought, well, I'll just ask a few of my friends who have been supporting me, you know, fans, uh, very encouraging, if they could help fund this. And um, amazingly, they all agreed to do it. So I raised all the money f to, to make the recording. And then I started to show it to different people in the industry. And it had this um, remarkable reaction where people were really interested in it and um, led to me actually giving a debut recital in New York where I played the Goldberg Variations at Weill Hall, which is at Carnegie Hall. The Goldberg Variations uh, is, on the face of it, all about arithmetic. It's all about canons and canons and thirds and fifths and sevenths and inverted carons and mirror images of, of pieces of music. Does that, is it helpful for you to understand all that before you play, or is that you find as an obstacle between yourself and the music? I think it's really important to understand the architecture of a piece. And you know, in, some, in a piece that's kind of as sprawling as the Goldberg Variations, you definitely need to know um, the groupings. You know, he, it's all about the number three, you know, or the number of measures. It's important because it, sh it makes you think about how you're going to phrase those measures. And he will sometimes um, throw in something that doesn't seem quite right. You know, like you'll be thinking that it's a four-bar phrase and then suddenly it's, um, you know, a three-bar phrase instead. And so you need to know where those, those instances are occurring so that you can bring them out. Goldberg Variations is almost inextricably linked with the name of Glenn Gould. And is that how you first came to that work? Yes, the first time I remember hearing it was uh, when I was about 13. I remember even where I was, and it was one of those moments where, which, you know, you never forget when you first hear something that's so riveting. And I, I absolutely couldn't believe the, the beauty of the music and the depth of it and, and his playing of it, and um, became really obsessed with the piece. And, started to listen to other recordings of it as well. And when I decided to learn it, then I, then I went into a kind of mode of not listening to anything, not listening to any other interpretations, and just delving into the music itself, into the, the score, and um, trying to play it in many different kinds of ways. And 
sort of by process of elimination, things started to take shape. And, um, and it turned out that the way that I felt right playing it didn't sound at all like Glenn Gould. And, um, and that was quite interesting. I feel that it's very important to really listen to what the music is telling you. And if it winds up being strange, what you're doing and unusual, <clears throat> then so be it. If that seems to be what your conclusion is, that the, that the piece should be played in a certain kind of way. But some people, they, they think, Bach of all composers, it's highly arithmetical, it's highly worked out. The meter is very set. Mm. Uh, and this is, this is the Baroque, this isn't the Romantic period. But something mm. tells me you don't, you fight that. I don't think it's quite as metrical as people think. I think that musical notation is a very crude way of transcribing a musical thought. And, um, and in his music in particular, which is kind of such abstract music, I don't base too much on, on thinking about the rigidity of a bar line and, and what that means. I think that you need to look beyond that. You'll just approach the music regardless of when it was written and, and play it how you feel it. I think so, yeah. If I heard somebody playing Chopin without very much pedaling, but they, they did it in a way that, that had real conviction and that showed you something about the music that you might not have heard um, had they been using lots of pedal, then I would say that's a really interesting way to approach playing Chopin. And if somebody plays Bach and uses a great deal of pedal to enhance some kind of harmony that they want to enhance, I think that that's interesting too. E even though Bach didn't know what a pedal was. Right. I don't think he would have cared. I think he would have really loved the modern piano personally, but also I think you know he's not around now, so. Um, he he's not around, but there are, as you know, there are lots of people who are very fierce about this kind of thing. Yeah. And we've lived through a period of of um, uh, of almost fetishizing the authentic. I think fetishizing is the right word. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um, it's not about the music anymore to me. It feels like it's about um, having an angle on the music and you know, imposing certain kinds of stylistic rights and wrongs is something that is um, a fashion, a fad. You know, it goes through fads. Do you believe that what people are arguing about is actually based on an exact knowledge of, of what was actually authentic? Or, or do you think people are trying to sort of reconstruct modern rules for old times? I think it's impossible to get away from being modern, even when you're trying to reconstruct something. I mean, it seems to me like um, an impossible exercise to try to, to recreate what would have been happening in Bach's time. I guess my main feeling is that I didn't become a musician to be a historian. You know, I, I became a musician because the music speaks to me today as I am right now. Now for some people, going the route of historical performance practice is how they make the music speak. It's what lights up their imagination and, and there are absolutely amazing um, authentic music performers, you know, people that I really love to listen to. But I like to listen to them because of what they bring to the music and how they make the music alive. I'm not interested really in whether or not what they're doing was how Bach did it. So now with this latest recording, it's more Bach. Just, just tell me what, your, what, what, the, what the pieces are that you've chosen and, and why, that you've, why you've chosen them. Well, it's an interesting mix of music because it's both solo and with orchestra. Um, and there's a kind of symmetry to the program. I'm starting with a chorale prelude arranged by Busoni, Ishruf Sudir and then move on to the F minor concerto, um, and then to the G minor English suite, and then the D minor concerto, and end with the chorale prelude, uh, Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring, arranged by Myra Hess. And um, so I think it kind of breaks up the sound, because you have solo piano imitating organ, and you have solo piano with orchestra, and you have an English suite, which is essentially um, the first movement of it is a concerto, but it's all on one instrument. 
I think that Bach really didn't think so much in terms of specific instruments. I don't think that um, he was writing for a particular sound. I think that he thought about music in a much more abstract way. It's much more about a pure sense of music than about whether or not it's for piano or for organ or for voice. Tell me about the title that you've chosen for the, for the disc. Well, this title I, comes from a, a quote by Francis Bacon about beauty. And um, I'm sure that the quote could be interpreted in many different ways. But basically, he's saying that what makes something beautiful is that it has some strangeness in the proportion. So the way I interpret this with Bach is that, um, that his music is, is irregular. Everything about the way that he writes is about being just a little bit mysterious and unexpected and not giving you the music as you would think it should be. And I think that is really what makes one of the things that makes his music so mysterious and, and, and unusual.